from the nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. Our guest for this edition of Conservative Roundtable is a dear friend, David Keene the chairman of the American Conservative Union. He's been the chairman of ACU since 1984, and he's done many other things. He's on the board of the National Rifle Association, and uh, he does more than shoot varmints when he goes hunting. Uh, I got to know David uh, when he was the chairman of Young Americans for Freedom, and I got to know him really well when he was working for Vice President Ted Agnew. Uh, Dave and I share the view that uh, Vice President Agnew has not been fully appreciated or acclaimed by history. I think he was a great man and that he would have been a great president had uh, he become president. And uh, Dave Keene, as Agnew's assistant, helped bring uh, Agnew's visceral instinct toward conservative views, which had developed in the wake of the Baltimore riots, to a full-blown intellectual conservatism. Uh, David, you spent a lot of time getting him up to speed on issues and books and whatever. He was, uh, he was an interesting guy because uh, he, was, he was intellectually curious. Uh, it was when I first met Gene Kirkpatrick and a lot of other people who, who later came to dominate uh, the political scene because if, uh, if Ted Agnew read an article by someone, he'd buzz me on the intercom and say, do you know them or can you get hold of them? Let's have them up here for lunch. Let's discuss, discuss the article. Let's talk about the ideas. And the politicians that are interested in ideas, as you know, are relatively rare. Yeah. So when you get hold of one, you like to spend as much time as you can with them. Right. I've been fortunate because I've, I've uh, been associated with a number of politicians like that. Jim Buckley from Jim New York. Jim was a great man. I've, um, I've never met a finer man uh, who served in the Senate than Jim Buckley. What a superb human being. What a terrific senator he was, and what a great staff he had. And he was a great judge. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, was on the Circuit Court of Appeals here for the District of Columbia uh, after serving as Under Secretary of State after he left the Senate. And uh, before he left the court here, uh, he was voted by those who practiced before it as the best judge on the court. A magnificent man, and his staff was an all-star staff. A lot of them went on to bigger things. Big and bigger and better stuff. Great man. Another reason, uh, David, that I've always appreciated you is uh, you share my view that the legal services program of the federal <laughs> government is one of the most evil scams ever perpetrated on the American people. That's when we got to know each other. Yeah, which, which, is, uh, which has done more harm than any other federal program. It's done a good bit of harm and still does. It's added $2 trillion to the federal budget over the years and, and many other things. And... Uh, well, you deserve uh, congratulations. The uh, Conservative Political Action Conference, which has been going on for many years, uh, had its uh, biggest and best year this year. We had 7,100 people. Wow. You compare that to 1974 when we had our first conference. I didn't organize that one. I'm old but not uh, <laughs> haven't been involved that long. Uh, the first conference drew about 100 people. And the speaker was Ronald Reagan. And uh, among those who attended was a young undergraduate who dragged her boyfriend along. That was Marilyn Quayle. And she dragged him through many things after that. Uh, but uh, it grew steadily from then until now when it's, uh, as I say, 7,100 people. This year, uh, the conservatives who attended heard the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, and every, every Republican candidate who was at that point uh, still in the race it's where Mitt Romney withdrew from the race. It's where, where uh, John McCain made his quasi-appeal for conservative support. Uh, and it was a fairly exciting conference. It dominated the news for several days. It was interesting because uh, the conference is important not only for the conservatives who attend. It's become sort of the must, the must place that you have to be if you're a conservative activist. But its other importance is in the media to show the conservative strength. And each, every few years we get a spate of articles, as you know, that the movement's dead, it's gone, it's going away, they're not important, nobody has to pay any attention. Uh, and this year, again, uh, they looked at it and they said, well, if they're so unimportant and if they don't matter, why does the president, the vice president, and all the other people come here? Uh, they come because the conservative movement 
uh, and the activists that attend these conferences and attend a lot of other things are the people that care about the future of the country and that do the work in political campaigns that spell the difference between victory and defeat on the right side of the spectrum. We were talking about uh, Senator James Buckley. Uh, toward the end of February of this year, his brother, William F. Buckley, Jr., uh, died. Uh, I have many fond memories of Bill Buckley. Uh, back in 1960, I had just been elected as a sophomore president of the Harvard Student Council, and Buckley did me the great honor of letting me be one of the speakers at the fifth anniversary dinner of uh, National Review. Mass Review uh, and, I was at that dinner. And uh, that was a tremendous thrill for me. Uh, when I came under attack, and I know you were under attack for your politics when you were in college and thereafter, uh, he wrote a couple of columns defending me in uh, National Review. And one of the things I most appreciate about Bill Buckley was during the p period in the 80s when I was spending a lot of my time trying to help uh, Jonas Savimbi and the anti-Soviet freedom fighters in Angola. And we were being thwarted to some degree by Chester Crocker, uh, the very left-wing Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Uh, I called on Buckley and I said, we've got to get the President's attention on this. Would you please do a column? And uh, we sat down for coffee and dessert at a restaurant in New York. And he said, you write the column. And I did. And he sent it out of, over his name, which was a tremendous honor. Well, you honor. know, <laughs> that, that's an honor. Uh, when he died, uh, I got calls from reporters and said, what was, what was the importance? What role did uh, Bill Buckley play? And I, and I said to one, he was not only there from the beginning. In many ways, he was the beginning. Uh, young conservatives don't really realize it, but back in the 50s, there was no conservative tradition to speak of. Uh, the liberals, uh, uh, Lionel Trill Trilling almost exuberantly wrote that there's no legitimate conservative movement or tradition in the United States. In a very short period of time, Bill Buckley changed that. Uh, National Review became sort of the incubator for a new ideological movement. He brought together very different kinds of people, anti-communists, libertarians, free market economists, uh, traditional conservatives, and out of that came a movement uh, that within a very few years, when you think about it, uh, took control of a major party, nominated Barry Goldwater to run for president, uh, uh, energized an entire generation of activists, and that resulted in the election of Ronald Reagan and many changes in the country. Uh, without Bill Buckley, there would have been no Goldwater. There would have been no Reagan. The Soviet Union would probably still exist. Uh, and he did all this really himself and you know you knew him and and those who knew him were were on the one hand sort of captivated by his humanity and his wit and his and all of this but what amazed me and amazed people that knew him was the energy I mean, this was a guy who think about it uh, he wrote enough columns to fill a, a, sh a shelf of books he, and they say that uh, his son Christopher Buckley said that he was writing a column when he died, he died at the at age of 82 yep. His, uh, his television program, Firing Line, was the longest running uh, public affairs program in the history of broadcast television. He wrote Lord knows how many novels and books, uh, and he gave as many as 50 to 75 speeches a year for 40 years, while at the same time editing and running uh, perhaps uh, one of the two or three most influential opinion journals in the country, and then spending a good deal of time skiing, playing the harpsichord, and sailing. and sailing the Atlantic. And when you think of any of those things, they're all enough to wear you out. Uh, it, was, uh, it was an amazing thing. I, I, I would remember when I was a student, him coming. I was at the University of Wisconsin. He'd come to Madison for the, remember, the National Student Association fights. He was on the wrong side. He was representing the CIA right? <laughs> against those of us who were fighting but the he, and he would But he would come, and he'd do whatever he was doing all day, and then he would write a column, and then join you again. I mean, it was his whole life was uh, was something that would wear out the average man in 20 years, and he, he kept it up till the day he died. Truly an amazing man. Well, David, you do many things. You've got a uh, political column in The Hill, which is a significant uh, publication, widely read by members of Congress, lobbyists, lawyers, etc. And uh, you uh, talk about uh, presidential candidates and uh, Senate candidates and other things, and, and you give an overview of what's happening in the world. 
We're going to have to take a break, but when we come back from the break, I'd like to get your assessment of the various people who ran for president this year and where you think the presidential campaign may yet go. Please stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages. There are many conservative organizations, but the Conservative Caucus is unique in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government, or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. Mom has given us all so much. And I'm really glad she gave us a chance to live. See, I just saw government numbers that say over half of the 3,000 abortions a day in this country are repeats. That means two, three, or even four abortions for the same woman. Imagine whole families, just like ours, that would have been, but aren't. It's really got me thinking. Come on, you're going to tell me that buying one imported towel is going to cost someone their job? Ever tried shopping for clothes with a four-year-old? I can't be looking for where the stuff is made. Since 1980, nearly half a million Americans who make apparel and home fashions have lost their jobs. Even though the quality of our products is second to none. Which makes you wonder if it's foreign competition that's hurting us. So the shirt's imported. Who's it going to hurt? Or if it's us that's hurting us. Buy American and Americans work. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, and our special guest is the chairman of the American Conservative Union, David Keene. David is a leading expert on American Good. politics uh, with uh, judgment uh, sought by many. Now, let's talk about the presidential campaign. You were supporting Romney at one point. Uh, why did Romney not succeed, in your opinion? Well, First of all, I have to have a caveat about your introduction there. I, this year I've been wrong about a number of things. Uh, I didn't believe that John McCain could conceivably get the Republican nomination because I thought that he had a ceiling on his support that would make it impossible. Uh, I thought he was dead at one point. I was obviously wrong. I told somebody that when we were putting CPAC together, they said, which ones are you going to invite? I said, I'm going to invite all of them because this is, resembles the Night of the Living Dead and you can't count on anybody being out of it. But uh, the reason, more importantly, the reason that McCain emerged was uh, that uh, conservatives were split. Uh, he was unable to, um, to get conservative voters in any, in fact, in the primaries, while it was still being contested, the only state in which John McCain carried a, ma a major or a plurality of self identified conservatives was Connecticut, and that's not a big number. Uh, so in all the other states, including Arizona, he failed to carry them. But they were split between Mitt Romney uh, and Mike Huckabee. And at one point, uh, during, as, it, as, it, as it developed, it became clear both to McCain and to everyone else that uh, the real threat to him was Mitt Romney. And so, as you'll recall, those debates and things, he and Huckabee sidled up each, with each other to destroy uh, Romney. McCain was happy about that because Huckabee didn't have the legs to go on and defeat him and, and that would guarantee him the nomination. Yeah, I was surprised that Fred Thompson, we all know the uh, talk about 
was not having the energy, being lazy, et cetera. But it seemed to me that he was right down the middle uh, well, of, of the conservative movement of the Republican Party. In the early day, I was for Fred Thompson. I didn't actually endorse him, but I spent a lot of time with him and his people. And uh, I eventually concluded that the book on him was right. He was lazy. And he wasn't about to go out there and do it. He had, I, I told one of his top people from the beginning, I've been involved in a lot of presidential campaigns. You've worked for Reagan, for Bush, for Nixon? The whole, the whole, and, you know, and, and for the, <clears throat> I said from a purely professional standpoint, I didn't know anyone who had been handed the opportunity that was presented to Fred Thompson. I said from a professional standpoint, if he doesn't take advantage of it, nobody should ever bother with him again. Because, and he really kicked away an opportunity that, just think of his own state. Lamar Alexander, the senator from Tennessee, former governor, wanted to be president, ran for president, could never get there. Fred Thompson, without announcing, was one of the top two candidates at the very beginning. All he had to do was give those people who looked at him and said, we hope he's our guy. All he had to do was put enough energy behind it to... To, to get them to say, okay, let's go with him. He didn't do that. And as a result, and, and, and his presence in the race prevented the coalescing around someone like Romney and made it possible for the, uh, Rudy Giuliani thought it was going to be him, but it wasn't. And one of the things that, uh, that aided McCain and defeated Romney was that the Giuliani campaign imploded all by itself about two weeks too early because as he went down, McCain came up because many of the same kind of voters were attracted to these two candidates. So, you know, I've often said that the two things that beat the heck out of uh, talent, experience, and organization are timing and luck. And among those, luck beats everything. And this year, luck was with John McCain. And as a result of that, he overcame things that he should not have been able to overcome. And he and he's managed to secure the, no the party's nomination. The question is whether he can make anything of that. Duncan Hunter's a friend of mine. I like him very much. I love Duncan. And, uh, but his campaign was like a lead balloon. Why did he do so poorly? Well, first of all, he wasn't known. We knew Duncan. And Duncan was, was an in right influ so influential member of Congress. But he was not well known. And he uh, actually, he, he developed into a pretty good candidate by the end. Uh, I was, was going up to his office and I said, Duncan, you may not win this thing, but my God, you got a better haircut, you're wearing better clothes, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> you're giving good speeches, so it's been very useful to you. But he didn't start out that way. Yeah. And of course, the book is written early. Yeah. And, uh, and so Duncan wasn't taken seriously until it was too late to take him seriously. Yeah. And I think that was it. But he's a, he's a very good guy, I would hope, that uh, a that if a Republican were to win, that he would be a logical choice for the Secretary of Defense. He's terrific on defense. That's right. He's terrific on China, which is an issue neglected mm -hmm. by so many people. Now, I'm a big fan of Ron Paul. He's been a friend of mine for years, and uh, he raised a lot of money. Uh, he, his campaign was boosted when Rudy Giuliani attacked him. Uh, <laughs> But uh, he, he really never well, rose above 10 or 11 percent. No, but it, because he wasn't, I, I wrote a column on, the, on the, the Paul phenomena. And I said, you know, you remember those Disney cartoons where the, uh, there's a puff of smoke and your conscience appears on your shoulder and says, here's what you really think and you ought to do it? Well, that was Ron Paul. You know, maybe all the voters and all the all the politicians are too sophisticated, but as I put it at the end of the column, I said, you know, we might like to drink blended whiskey, but when we smell the real thing, it's, it has a certain attraction. Right. And that was, that was Ron Paul. He did make the, I mean, he, 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 I think, and this is where I think the pundits were all wrong. They thought this, that the Paul campaign was simply uh, that these were the anti-war uh, part of the party. I, don't th I think if the war hadn't been an issue, he'd have done better. Because he made the, uh, the historic libertarian mistake, which was made during the Cold War by libertarians, who rightly assessed that government grows during time of war, and then concluded if you didn't have wars, government wouldn't grow. That makes sense. And therefore, you shouldn't have wars. Therefore, there isn't an enemy.
So if you remember back in the 70s, a lot of the libertarians said, well, the Soviets are not a problem, it's us. And, and Ron Paul came to that same conclusion about the terrorists and all of this. And just because you're right, you still have to realize, and the American people think this is a dangerous world we live in. And it's one thing to say, we shouldn't have done this, or we should have done this differently, or we should be more cautious, we have to worry about checks and balances, all of the things that I agree with Ron Paul on. But if you then conclude that there ain't any enemies out there, they're going to look at you and say, you know, you ought to go out there and take a look. Ron Paul has developed an extraordinary mailing list, uh, tremendous fundraising potential. Uh, he's not going to be the Republican nominee, but what can he do with all that? Well, if he's, if he sh what he shouldn't do is become a perennial Ralph Nader, uh, you know, either as an independent or within the party. And, and he doesn't want to, he's, he's given signals that he's not going to go off as an independent. What he can do is exert a tremendous amount of influence on the party. He's got young people. He's got hundreds of thousands of young people. He has generated millions of dollars over the Internet, and he's, he, his people have shown an energy and a commitment to the things that, that we did. Don Devine, as you know, who is an officer in the ACU and has been around forever, longer even than I have. He was a member of the first YAF chapter in Brooklyn, sent a thing, uh, uh, an email to uh, YAF veterans uh, and said, if you were 19 years old, would you you have voted for Ron Paul. And most of them came back and said, yeah, we would have. Because that's what, that's the kind of candidacy, the real thing that, uh, that attracts young people and gets them involved. And, if, and I think the, the other candidates did a disservice to themselves and the party, as well as Paul, by attacking him and using him like a pinata. Because, in fact, his candidacy and the response to it told him something. And that is that there's a lot of people out there who continue to believe in the true religion, if you will. Uh, that, that believe in limited government and that want them to do it. That's part of the problem with Washington is they think that the real thing is somehow laughable. It's not laughable. So what Paul ought to do is he ought to take that, that tremendous base that he's got, uh, and he, ought, he can turn it into an advocacy organization with him as the sort of spiritual leader that can really have some influence on the Congress and on policy regardless of who the president is. And I think that's what he's going to do. I have no idea what he's going to do. Uh, um, but uh, if, 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 if it was me, that's what I'd do. Because what you're really talking about, why did we get into politics? We didn't get into politics to run for office. Some of us ran for office. Some of us won. Some of us lost. You didn't get into politics. To, you, you got into politics to influence policy and to create a better world. And so you have to sit down with whatever resources and talents you have, whoever you are, and ask yourself, what's the, what, what's the most effective thing I can do? And that's not always what you might want to do, right. but it's what you can do. And Ron Paul can't be president. That's not going to happen. He probably can't even win a Senate seat in, in Texas, but he can hold on to his congressional seat, and he can take what he's got and make himself an influence for good for many, many years. We have a short time before the break. Uh, give us a capsule analysis of Mike Huckabee. What do you think of Huckabee? He, he's the most talented performer of all of the uh, candidates in either party. The problem he had is that on significant issues uh, to the Republican base, he had in problems. I mean, this whole fair tax thing was, was really, in my view, a smokescreen to avoid criticism for his, his tenure as governor in Arkansas, where he was a high-tax, big-spending populist. He's a religious populist, not a conservative. And, uh, he, you know, he's a, he's a nice enough fella. He's a great performer. He's done some good things. I like him personally. Uh, but he, he, was, he was not running as a conservative in reality. He was running as a populist. Uh, and he governed as a populist. And had he ever made it to the presidency, that's what he would be. Uh, he would be a big government. We, we put it euphemistically as a big government conservative, but it's more than that. And in some ways, it's worse than that. We have to take a break. When we come back, I'm going to ask David Keene to offer his predictions on uh, the ultimate final Republican ticket, President and Vice President. Will it be John McCain? And if it is, who will be his running mate? Stay with us. We'll be right back. There are many conservative organizations but the Conservative Caucus is unique. 
in that our standard for evaluating public policy is the Constitution of the United States. Our goal is to advocate policies which conform to what the Constitution stipulates and to oppose those which undermine the Constitution. It's clear that the federal government has only those powers which are provided in the Constitution, which were initially delegated by the states to the federal government, or which were subsequently added by amendment. If we adhered to that principle, your taxes would be lower and your liberties would be more secure. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Welcome back. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, check out the website of the Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org. And if you want to learn more about the work that Dave Keene does, uh, check him out at the contact information on your screen. David, we have less than a minute. Who, If John McCain is the Republican presidential nominee, who will be his running mate? That's a hard question to answer because I don't know what's going through his mind, but if he's smart, he'll put together the, pa the base, he'll unite the conservative base so that he can go into the fall with a united party. And the easiest way to do that is also the way to, it requires him to pick somebody who's outside Washington, who's a symbolically capable, smart conservative, and that's Mark Sanford of South Carolina, the governor of South Carolina. If he picks him, conservatives will rally around him because they'll Sanford's know that the party's man. in he, good... He's uh, a strong pro-lifer. He achieved fame by carrying two pigs under his arm into the legislature to uh, protest the pork for which uh, the legislature he's, was voting. He's, he's a very effective governor. He served in Congress. He's bright. He's yeah. young. He's articulate. Uh, and conservatives know him and like him. David, thank you for having been our guest. My pleasure. Thank you for watching Conservative Roundtable.